Welcome to this tutorial video. Today we're going to be looking at using Markov chains. So very briefly, we'll take a quick look at this uh, Wikipedia page that has a useful diagram of a Markov chain. And as you can see, when we use a Markov chain, we define a certain number of states. Um, so this one has two states, E and A. And associated with each state is a list of probabilities, one for returning to the state that we're at, um, and then however many, depending on however many other states there are. So for example, if we had states E, A, and then another one over here for B, um, we'd have one probability of returning to state E, one probability for going to state A, and then one probability for going to state B. In this case, we've just got two states, um, and so we've got a probability for returning to each state, um, 0.3 to return to E if we're at E, and 0.6 to return to A if we're at A. And then for each, we've got a probability of going to the opposite state. And as you'll notice, it's uh, very important that we uh, ensure that the probabilities emanating from each state add up to 1. Um, and that'll be important as we take a look at our patch in Open Music. Before we go there, um, you may be interested to know that this Wikipedia page uh, also has some uh, brief discussions about applications in music and specifically in related software, CSound, Mac, Super Collider, etc. Um, and I'm sure that there are you know, far more uh, interesting and scholarly articles available on platforms like ProQuest um, if you're interested more in how to use Markov chains. So let's take a look at um, one application of, of this concept to sort of demonstrate how it can be used in open music. In a different video I talked a little bit about um, the creation of a series of patches to help develop a um, rhythmic exercise kind of anthology, a graded anthology of exercises for use in an undergraduate classroom. And Markov chains were uh, an essential part of making that happen, um, mostly because their, their use is in producing um, you know, seemingly random content that is actually carefully um, guided or stipulated by the probabilities that we assign uh, to proceeding from one state to the other. So in this case, what I've done is I've defined a list of uh, 10 different rhythmic figures. So we've got two eighths, a quarter and an eighth, um, an eighth and an eighth rest, etc. And you can see all those here. And I I'm using that in this patch here labeled process um, as the basis for uh, how our Markov matrix is assigned to rhythmic figures. So at a fundamental level the Markov matrix will be um, deciding how we proceed from one of these rhythmic patterns to the next. And I won't go into all the detail of how I arrived at that. It was mostly a process of trial and error and uh, just slowly adjusting the probabilities. But the basic idea was I wanted to come up with rhythmic figures that felt somewhat natural. Um, and so, for example, I would do things like avoiding um, you know, unnecessarily large amounts of syncopations all in a row, um, things like that. So the object in open music that I used is this one, uh, Markov 2, and I'll quickly open the documentation for this. Um, but you can see it just has a couple of arguments. Um, so we've got uh, a list format for our Markov matrix. We need to specify the very first state um, for, the, for the Markov process, and then we also need to specify how long we want the resulting sequence to be. So how many states it will process through. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. So we'll come back here.
And you'll notice uh, what we've done, this first inlet here um, in this process patch uh, is coming from this patch that I will open in a moment where I actually define the Markov matrix, um, this one here. So that's the first inlet. Um, and then the second inlet uh, is, what is this one doing? Oh, the second inlet, if I remember correctly, I believe is assigning um, the rhythmic figures defined in this list here. Uh, so it's mapping those onto the states uh, generated by the Markov uh, matrix or the Markov process. And then in determining the, uh, the original state, I just have a random uh, number generator that will just pick a, a state, you know, 1 through 10 at random. One thing that I should mention that can be a little confusing at first, uh, so if, if you remember from uh, earlier tutorial videos, you'll know that if we're indexing a list, um, we don't number the elements of the list 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And we actually start with 0. So this would be, you know, if I use an nth function here um, and pull it over to this list. Oops. Uh, pull over the inlet. One second. There we go. Um, and if I specify item 0, that will return our two eighths in a row. Item 1 will be the quarter eighth, as we see. So in the list, our indexing starts with 0. But when we're working with the Markov matrix, it will start uh, indexing its states at uh, 1. So if you notice this OM random object, I don't specify 0 through 9, I specify 1 through 10. And then when I go to map that to the items from this list coming in on the second inlet here, I actually have to subtract the resulting states of the Markov matrix by 1 so that as I'm indexing this list, those will align properly. Okay, so that's how I'm setting this up. The last thing I'll mention um, I just picked an arbitrarily large number, in this case it was 48, for the number of states that I want the Markov matrix to produce. It actually ends up producing more rhythmic material than I have need for, so I end up kind of chopping off the end of it. And you can see that here where I just ask it to take um, essentially the first seven bars, I believe. Um, so the way that I actually ended up producing these examples was I would ask for the first seven bars of the matrix, I would have this patch produce a cadence depending on the meter of the example, and append that at the end of those first seven bars. So we've got seven bars, um, the eighth bar is a cadence, and then uh, the same thing again, seven more bars, and then a cadence for the eighth bar, string those together, and then that was the output that we would see here. So as for defining the Markov matrix, I found it helpful to make um, separate patches to do that because it can be a little bit more involved. I'm sure there's got to be a, a more elegant way to achieve this uh, by using you know, map car or maybe reduce uh, functions in open music. Um, at the time that I was first making you know, this patch, I wasn't really thinking along those lines. So I think if I went back to do it again now, it might be a little different. But this has gotten uh, the job done for the meantime. So what I'll do, um, what I'll do is I'll open up uh, this little internal patch. And uh, each of these inlets you can see um, over here uh, where I've specified a probability. Um, and in some cases the probabilities are all integers. Um, in some cases they're, you know, they involve a, a decimal or floating point number. And that's fine because in, inside this patch um, I have a loop that will uh, add all of these items together, um, divide it by the number of items um, 
so that we get to, uh, or no, I'm sorry, it will, it will divide it by the sum of the items so that we get to um, a probability of one normalized as the output of the patch. Um, and that's really important. So if you, uh, if you don't include a step like this to make sure that all of your um, probabilities are adding up to one, uh, you'll get an error when the Markov uh, object goes to process the list. So what am I doing in this patch? Um, each of these, of course, is representing a state. So this uh, first internal patch corresponds to this first rhythmic figure, two eighth notes. And so up above here, I'm specifying the probability of repeating, going back to the two eighth notes, um, the probability of going to a quarter and an eighth, the probability of going to an eighth and an eighth rest, etc. So each of these is specifying the probability of proceeding to a different rhythmic figure as a certain weighted number, where a higher number um, will result in a higher probability. And again, this is fairly arbitrary. I uh, just sort of subjectively determined uh, how, how uh, not how likely, but how um, maybe idiomatic it would be to proceed from one rhythmic figure to the next um, if I were uh, working through these examples. And so uh, once I've done that for the first one, I, I do it again for the second item. So in this case, we're starting on the quarter eighth and the probability of going to two eighths, the probability of returning to the quarter eighth, etc., all the way down the line. And so each of these is just adding another um, item to our matrix. So all of these are then collected into a list. The list is uh, output here, and then it's taken right into this Markov uh, two object to be processed. Um, and that's, that's basically the extent of, of how this is used in this patch. Um, I think I've uh, covered most of the errors or little factors that you might encounter. I'll just briefly show, um, show one other case where I've used this. Um, and this may be a case uh, that I make a separate video on later. Um, let me pull up a good example. All right. So this, um, let me check to see where I put it. Yeah, okay. So this patch is um, maybe slightly different from the ways that I would uh, typically be using open music. What I wanted to do was um, create a two-dimensional uh, area, two-dimensional plane, uh, 20 by 20 units, uh, in extent and define a trajectory through this area starting with the blue dot ending at the red dot and then defining four other uh, landmarks so in some of my implementations uh, these are randomly produced in others I actually specify the coordinates for each of these landmarks and this is one of those cases you can see over here but the basic idea is that each of these landmarks uh, represents a different pitch class um, or perhaps a different collection of pitches, depending on uh, which particular patch I'm looking at. And this trajectory represents a sort of um, kind of wandering listener. So for example, um, starting at this uh, first location very close to this landmark, say this represents uh, C sharp. Um, the resulting musical material would be very heavily uh, infused with C-sharp and then less so as the trajectory continues away. Um, so that's, that's true for each of these little landmarks. They're each corresponding to a different pitch or pitch collection. And it's a way of sort of gradually um, changing the probability of hearing the, those different pitches over the course of the uh, musical passage. 
And I should note that this was a concept um, that I became interested in after reading Dmitry Tomasko's uh, wonderful book, A Geometry of Music, where he goes through and, and describes some very um, kind of gradual, continuous transformations uh, of pitch class content uh, over the course of a musical passage. And so then I uh, also, you know, just made a couple of little uh, points here where I could analyze the results. Uh, this graph actually shows the relative uh, probability of each of the pitch classes or pitch collections appearing over the course of the musical pattern. Um, so that's been helpful to just get a little snapshot of what's actually going on. But at the heart of all this uh, is the use of another Markov matrix. And in this case, if I remember correctly, um, I just use a basic distance formula to, um, to quantify the distance between uh, this kind of wandering uh, either person <laughs> or uh, point along the trajectory uh, and each of the landmarks. So at first it was a little involved to get this to work, um, but basically I segment this trajectory um, in this case, I think I've got a hundred segments. So I ask Open Music to calculate a hundred points along this path, and at each of those points, calculate the distance to each of the landmarks that I've specified. And uh, those then are all turned into the relative probabilities that are at use in this Markov matrix. And again, I was able to borrow this same uh, loop that we saw in the other rhythm patch to make sure that I'm not exceeding, uh, exceeding uh, you know, 100% as the probability. Um, and it's produced some really interesting results so far. Uh, so these are kind of groupings of, uh, of the pitch output. Here's the continuous stream of pitch output. Um, and in this case, uh, it's all clustered around uh, just a very few uh, you know, close pitch classes. Um, in other cases, I've used um, different ways of defining the trajectory. So let's see. Uh, oh, actually, I think what I want is this one. Yes, so in this case, um, oops, no, that's not the one I want at all. Let's give this a try. Yeah, here we go. This one defines a, a segment of a spiral um, using polar coordinates. Um, and it works on a sort of uh, octatonic collection here. And this one actually did pr produce some very um, interesting results. And the nice thing is this one is randomized, so I can evaluate uh, repeatedly. And each of these windows will update and I'll get a new result and I can uh, do some listening. So all of this is to demonstrate just a few ways that Markov chains can uh, easily produce not only um, interesting pseudo-random results, um, but ones that are, that are uh, you know, of course, kind of carefully controlled um, and can very easily produce some idiomatic uh, gestures, pitch collections, rhythms, etc. So I hope this video has been useful. Let me know if you have any questions or comments, or of course if you have ways, um, you know, suggestions of improving the patch or improving any of these ideas. Um, and I hope to see you soon in the next video.